Good evening. My name is Dwight Sadoff, and I am with Project Finance and Development. And uh, we are the development company uh, looking at doing the project on the south of Lake Pickett Road. Um, otherwise, it's been referred to as Lake Pickett South. Uh, just to make real clear, I know it's been said, but I constantly get questions about this even from the news media. We are not Lake Pickett North. We have nothing to do with Lake Pickett North. They don't have anything to do with us. You can hate my guts, hate my project, love theirs. You can love theirs, hate mine. The county might approve mine, might not approve theirs, vice versa. We just happen to have two parcels that are side by side going at about at the same time through the approval process. So I just want to make that uh, clear. Um, what, we have been, what we're proposing for the South property is um, an idea that I had. I thought it was an original idea. It turns out there's a half a dozen or more projects like this around the country and they're referred to as an aggregate. Never used this before, let me make sure it works. Okay, and tonight we're announcing for the first time the name of our community is going to be called The Grove, a farm and garden community. This is, um, by the way, while I'm speaking, the question is going to be a microphone up here somewhere. Only you know where it is? Okay, right here, so while I'm speaking, if you hear something that you want to ask a question about, why don't you come up to the microphone? Um, and then after I'm done, I'm supposed to do about a 15-minute presentation, and I think you guys have about 15 minutes to ask me questions. And let's just try to all be respectful to each other. All right, so this is a map that's an aerial that shows the location of the grove relative to the surrounding area. Just some basic property information. We have 1,216 total acres. We have lakes and wetlands totaling 337, which leaves total upland acres of 879. We have 4,540 feet of frontage on State Road 50, and our distance to the 408 is 2.5 miles. Uh, this is a collaborative effort amongst the landowners in South. Um, by working together and being able to come together, not come individually, we will have one coordinated, after, let me finish my presentation, um, one coordinated cohesive development plan. Um, what we think that this will do is instead of piecemeal development, one parcel going on its own, um, untethered to the others, it'll provide more value to the project and also I think to the surrounding area. These are some of the uh, large employers that are within about a four mile as a crow flies radius of the property. Um, you can see that for yourself. Siemens, UCF, Central Florida Research Park, um, Lockheed Martin, and of course Waterford Lakes is, is there as well. Uh, these are just distances, from, again, as the crow flies from our property to these various local landmarks. Uh, of course, we've got the schools that are uh, very in very close proximity uh, to our east. The uh, one thing that I think is lost on a lot of people, maybe not you guys in the room, is that there's already 8,000 people that live east of our property. Um, to our south is another census tract with 8,700 people. This is, uh, shows you the, some of the projects that are, again, in our vicinity and to our east. Corner Lake Estates, which is literally adjacent to my property, and um, has about four units per acre, net acre, so it's four, four units per net acre. They're 50-foot lots. The Cypress Lakes project with 1,263 lots, those are all built out, by the way, has a density of also four, in fact, I think it's 4.4 per net. And you'll see in a little bit, our densities don't even come close to approaching those densities, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've got 4,000 feet in front of them, say, Road 50. Uh, Orlando, it's a dynamic place. Most of us live here because of the opportunities it provides. Uh, Forbes says that we are the top city in the entire country for job growth uh, in 2014. Uh, population growth during the period of 1990 to 2000 in Florida was 23.5%. Orlando population growth, you can sort of see the, 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 the uh, graph there for yourself, see that upward trajectory. In the top right, the 2010, the latest census data, shows our population as two, and this is a, 
uh, Orlando MSA, 2134000 That represents a growth rate of about 30%. Orange County's planning department projects growth in the next five years just in Orange County at 132 resident, 132,000 residents. The average household size in Orange County is 2.64. So when you divide that into 132,000, Orange County needs 50,265 new households or new homes over the next five years. That's how many households are being formed in the next five years. This is um, Frank Hank Fishkind, who's probably the most well-known local economist, was on NPR radio the other morning in March, and he presented this graph. It was on their website. And the middle one, which is Orlando, it's a little blurry, but you'll see the household growth is at 30,000 households in 2014, but the housing starts is only at 15,000. So that's 15,000 people, households, not people, households, that will have to find a house somewhere. They're not finding it in Orange County, so what they're likely doing is going to Kissimmee or Polk County, and then they're getting on the roads and driving to work. Um, we'll be If he were a builder in Central Florida, what product would he be building? Hank Fishkind's response was, I'd be building single-family houses. There is a lot of legitimate demand for single-family houses. Affordable. So, and the reason I show you that is to put our conversation in perspective. Because I've lived here since 1980. I live, uh, still live on basically a pop divide on the road. And, you know, when I moved here, I was 17 years old. There wasn't a street sign, street stop sign, or a street light between my house and I four, and um, obviously that's not the case anymore. And uh, so we just have a lot of development growth going on. I wasn't, as a developer, someone in the real estate business, to be honest with you, until I was starting to research some of these statistics. I was really shocked by it. I did not realize how how much we were growing. And obviously, everybody who's coming here needs rain shelter, and that's the reason we have these meetings packed with. You know, 400 people. As I was born in a town of 2,000 people in South Dakota, they don't have zoning fights there because no one's moving there. So again, I just want to put some perspective on what we're dealing with here, what the county's dealing with. Can we be polite to each other? All right. One second. So an agrihead, just a definition: a residential development where the focal points are a working farm and community gardens, in the same way that other communities focus on a golf, golf course, pool, or clubhouse. Uh, one in three households are now growing food. It's the highest participation rate in a decade. I'm giving you some slides here to explain why we think the agrihood idea makes sense. More millennials are growing their own food. This is a um, rendering, artist rendering of the main entrance to our project. It's where the working farm is, is located. And um, if you can kind of see on the bottom, that's State Road 50. We've got a lake in the middle. I wanted to have it so that people on 50 could see across the property and into the farm and start to get hit by that agro field. When you come in, there's a, uh, I I had a pointer, but there's a, um, let me go here. Stretches. Well, you can see the barn in the middle. Uh, below that, that road will be designed slightly wider than the typical county road, and we'll get it in our zoning that we can close it periodically to have a weekly farmers markets. You can see the where the, the farm is, the hedgerows. We're going to have a food to table, farm to table restaurant that's there on the left, next to a showcase garden. So you can be sitting out on the patio eating dinner, and sitting right next to a beautiful garden where your food's been, been picked. The event barn will be probably about one third post harvest production, and the balance of it will be used for community events. And I'll get more into that in a second. We hired, we've got a great team of consultants, but we needed kind of an unusual one, someone who, someone who is an urban planner, but also is a farmer. So we've got a team out of Atlanta called Farmer D Consulting. Uh, this is the D in, in, in Farmer D, Darren Joffe. He's actually harvesting shard in that photo. Um, gardening and farming are multi-generational. I know in my own household where we have a garden, my kids, to my parents love coming over and seeing what's growing and what's ready to be picked and, and eating it. And just some images of that, families you know, gardening. 
These are actually photos from some projects around the country that exist. The one on the top left is outside of Atlanta. It's called Serenby. All of these, by the way, have websites. They're very interesting. Um, the one on the top right is a project in Virginia called Willisburg. And the bottom one is a project in Phoenix, Arizona called Agritopia. I've actually been to Agritopia and Serenby. Our planners did Serenby, the one on the top left. So here's the image of our farmer's market. Again, I'm trying to give you a feel for what the community is that we're trying to design and develop. Uh, these farm stands actually are in some of these communities I just mentioned. I took a photo on the one on the left in Agritopia, top left. Just some icons giving you, again, a sense of what kind of community we're trying to develop. The split rail fencing, very rustic. A cistern, pump. Give, give it a second. Road houses. So here's the inside of the community event barn. Looks like they're having a wedding reception there. This is the outside of the community event barn. This would be the farm table restaurant. This is in Agritopia. Um, so we have a working farm. Kind of have three main big ag components to the project. The working farm which I showed you in the artist rendering. Community gardens, we've got, I think it's about uh, 27 or 17 acres of community gardens scattered throughout the project. This is where you can get a four by eight, four by 10 plot. Then we're gonna have a very robust home gardening program. If you just wanna do your own gardening. We're also gonna have a, um, uh, I know the county Code and state law allows it. I'm gonna, I actually know quite a bit about charter schools. I know most of the charter school operators around the country. I'd like to get a charter school here to do an ag-based school curriculum. Education is gonna be a big part of our community about how things are grown, how to grow them healthily, how to cook them in a healthy fashion. Also, I think this provides an internship opportunities for kids, college kids studying agriculture. We're gonna have an edible landscape trail that's probably about two miles long. Um, we'll have mangoes, avocados, um, citrus, I'm sure, certain nuts. And then the agriculturalists. We'll be hiring an agriculturalist whose job is pretty robust and manages the community farm and the CSA. The CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It's essentially a co-op, which members of the community outside of our, of our project can also join. The managed edible landscape trail, the community gardens, the distribution of produce to CSA members. Typically, these projects have about 30 or 40 restaurant partners to buy food from their from their farm. Uh, there's a whole litany of things. I don't want to run out of time, so let me just want to move on. Uh, we'll have uh, honeybees. Probably have a, a a grove or a um, orchard of some sort. We also have designed a three-acre equestrian facility. Uh, it's on the north edge of the project, right across the street from the Conalacache Sand Hills Conservation Area. I don't know exactly how many miles of trails, but I think it's something like 10. A lot of people, if you're not aware of it today, trailer their horses here. And our equestrian um, stable and paddock area will be literally across the street from this. Here's a map of it, you can kind of see it on either image. Connection between the two. Here's some photos from the trail itself. That's the Econ River. Okay, so in terms of planning and the policies that are being um, written and put forth to be approved or not, uh, as I think Ola mentioned, that the county is going more to a so-called transect-based planning method. And um, tonight, um, I wanted to uh, give you the transects that would be in our the Grove project on the south of uh, Lake Vicar Road. So there's basically four swaths or transects. The first one is T1, which is natural, where zero dwelling units are permitted. T2 would be 1.5 dwelling units per net acre. The, this would be the band of permitted densities on the northern portion of the project, which is the closest to the low density in the rural areas. T3 south would be more in the middle uh, heading down more towards 50, and then on 50 we have T4 uh, South, which is commercial and five dwelling units per acre, net acre. 
This is what the T1 natural looks like, natural lands, wetlands, lakes, conservation areas, and vegetative buffers. T2 will be, again, the larger lots, the larger homes. Uh, this is where the stables are. Um, I'll kind of leave it at that at this point. And by the way, in all of these zones, there's a 35% minimum open space requirement. That's beyond the wetlands and the lakes. So on the dry land, we also keep 35% of that land uh, open. These uh, images are from our plan to show more specifically how we're dealing with the, um, our property abuts this uh, part of South Tanner Road and also Lake Pickett Road. And we're putting a 100 foot uh, average buffer, which will be the natural vegetation as you see it today. The goal of it is that as you drive today and look at your windshield, what you see is what will be there, only to be enhanced where it's not very thick with, again, natural vegetation. It'll look just like the parts that are thick and what they're made of. Um, the lots will be one acre in size. The lots on Lake Pickett will be 300 foot deep. And I've got a cross section to give you a sense of what that means. There it is. Um, some of these are a little bit hard to understand, but if you see the cars over on the left, that's Lake Pickett. We're going to have a uh, trail there open to the public for bicycles, pedestrians, horses, and then a 100 foot, which is a vegetative um, buffer. And then the first structure of any sort, including pool screens, would be set back another 25 feet. So we are going to be creating opaque le landscape buffers, natural buffers, with the goal that you can't see into the community from those two, those two roads. This is more of the uh, T2 area. Now the T3 is a little bit higher density. It averages three per acre. Still pretty far below the, the to give you a sense of comparison, the other projects to our east I mentioned to you. We're trying to, this is starting to give you some sense of the design of the community. We want the design, the house design, the architecture, and the what I call the horizontal design, the landscape, the hardscape, to be in keeping with the area and, and with our our agrohood community. And these are some more images to, that we will be giving to our architects. If we get past the so-called transmittal stage in July, we'll be spending much more money on the design uh, aspects of the community. Here are some of the smaller homes, and but gives you a sense of the feel of those and the look. So T4 South, which is again the, the band of property immediately adjacent to State Road 50. And in a nutshell, one of the things I want to announce tonight, because I've gotten a lot of feedback from the community, is that we will have no apartments. The um, commercial area is limited to 237,000 square feet, which if you speak to planners on a community of this size, that's really a small amount of commercial. Um, again, the 35% open space requirement applies to this. And these are images starting to give you a sense of what the commercial is going to look like. The commercial is the front door to our community. Most of the commercial, in my humble opinion, on State Road 50 looks like crap. If I have my commercial look like what's out here today, it will completely ruin the value of the rest of my property. That's, with that and the design standards that are going to go into to effect, I think that's how we can assure the community that we will have a truly high quality, a local shop, destination sort of commercial area. That's our goal. Here again are some images of what we're trying to emulate. These are actually taken in the uh, city of Winter Garden. I don't know if any of you guys get over there, but they are really doing great, great things in their downtown. Slide through these kind of quickly. Uh, our front entrance, uh, we're looking at very low key, again, stuff that fits in with the aggregate idea. This is a project in Texas called Lantana. And then here's our conceptual site plan. We actually have this on a board up here, so after the meeting, if you want to come up and study it a little bit more. But you can see the sort of lighter color up there on the north and to the east all along Tanner. That's the low density, large lot area. And then that's the T2 south. The T3 south is in the middle. And um, also on here, and again, I wish I had a pointer, but um, you'll see various, the pink parcel is the elementary school. The green are the parks and the farms and the community gardens. Um, and then the brown, browner color at the bottom is the T4, 
with a little higher density residential, uh, no apartments, and uh, the limited commercial. We had proposed initially a development program of 2,961 units, and we have now gone into more uh, finer design of the community, and we're down to 2,256, which is a reduction of about 25% so that you see the changes. I know a number of you have seen me before, been to meetings with me, and I'm just showing you kind of updates of, uh, of our plans, and, and that's the uh, end of my presentation. So I'd be happy to take questions for 15 minutes. Anybody would like to come to the microphone? We have two microphones, one here, one over there. If someone can flip the, the back of the, um, the on-off switch, the very back, there you go. We've got another application after this to talk about, so let's try to limit it to a half hour and we'll see where we are and move on to the next one and then we'll go from there. Yes, sir. What, what prevents you from changing this plan from anything that you've showed? Okay, well, what really prevents me is having to go through this process again. But the, uh, so in order to change this, you would have to go through what's called this comp plan. It's a comp plan amendment. It's the county's 25-year vision as uh, was said earlier, for growth of the entire county. That's a very arduous process, number one. Number two, then you have your zoning approval. All of these things are approved by the Board of County Commissioners. They can't be changed unless we go through this type of process again. And three, and I'm going to figure out exactly how to do it, but we're committed to recording something in the, in the public record so that the community knows that even if you had a commission in the future that was willing to change it, that it can't be changed by deed restriction. Because this is what we're going to do, pure and simple. But what you're going to ultimately end up is with zoning changes that will allow for this building to take place. Correct. So at that point, once you cut those changes, then you made all of this possible. And you're going to have, again, free ability to, to change the structure, change the look, well, change the co-op and say, yeah, co-op's not going to work. Or now that we've used that to make everybody feel good, we're going to go ahead and move through and change the call. Let me tell you, some other. I may have answered a little too quickly. Um, the zoning plan, if we get past the transmittal in July, will will be worked on and submitted, and will go to the board simultaneously with the adoption of the policies that allow the aggregate community to be to be developed. So it, it happens simultaneously, not not sequentially. So you're saying you can't change anything from what you're presenting here once you get the zoning changes received? We are not going to change a thing. And I'll well, put it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a public record. I'm sorry? But you have the ability to. You say well, you're not going to. But anybody in this room today, tomorrow, when the county opens for business, can come and file an application to rezone their land. Anybody. So well, I can't tell you that I no longer have that right, but I'm telling you that it's a comp plan where the policies are that dictate how you design a community. It's the zoning, and it's going to be my word in a written document filed in the public record that assures the community that what we're showing you will be what gets developed forever. The common areas, the community uh, farm, the uh, working farm, the community garden, all that, that all gets deeded to a nonprofit or the homeowners association. So once that happens, that's irreversible. And that too will be restricted to the agricultural uses to be restrictions. I don't know of a better way to assure the community that what we're going to do is what I'm showing you. If anybody in the room has a, an idea, I'm, I'm all ears. It just seems disingenuous because this is like the fifth time that you've come before the county to try to change. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's not true. Um, what you guys have all seen probably many, many, many times is the rival property. That's north. I'm south. I haven't been here. This property has got an owner in Spain who's owned it for part of it for 20 years, another owner down in the Keys. And it's just, they don't even do anything with it. So that, I, I, along those lines, I do want to make one comment. The comp plan, I've heard people in the meeting say, well, the comp plan is a comp plan, it never changes. The county has changed the comp plan, we've checked with the planning department, to expand the urban service area 36 times in 12 years. So every year in the county to accommodate new growth and changes in how, uh, where people live and how it grows and how it develops, changes the comp plan urban service area three times a year on average. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I have two quick questions. One is um, with the wetlands, how much of that will be built upon or removed? 
Yeah, the wetlands, you pretty much don't touch. The only time as a developer, and I've never had a property in Florida where we didn't have some wetland. That's common. But the only time you touch a wetland is if you happen to need to get around a corner or there's a wetland strip that separates two upland tracks. But other than that, the county, the state, and depending upon the project, even the federal government has to approve any wetland impacts. Now when you do impact wetlands, it's very costly. But the money goes for a good purpose. You have to pay what's called mitigation uh, fees. And the money goes to a mitigation bank owner in an area where there's very sensitive, environmentally important lands, which the state has determined they really want to preserve. So that's how that process works. It's, it's very costly to impact a wetland. We would have impact, and we don't really need to impact wetlands here. I mean, it's not like we've got a lot of isolated uplands. So I wouldn't anticipate, we, our goal is always to have none, but very rarely can you get around not having any, but they're very minor. If we have 330 acres of wetlands, a typical project we would have might have an acre or two or three of impacts, but that's, that's the order of magnitude. And let's say this goes past the transmissal, transmittal stage, how soon before the first shovel hits the ground? I would say um, the soonest that any dirt would get turned would be September of 2016. That's well before the roads are done, right? Our, as was being mentioned, and first of all, by the way, we've got two more community meetings, and at the next community meeting, um, I know that we're planning to talk a lot about transportation and more the specifics. But as was mentioned, we've got the contract submitted by the DOT to the county to allow us to construct six lane improvements to State Road 50. So we're working on that, and those would be day one improvements. So we would be making those improvements day one. Ultimately, the county is going to require, if they like the planning here, and they think they need a plan for growth for the people moving here, they're going to require that the impacts from our project, the trips, the cars, are accommodated by actual improvements to the roads. I think in the past, one of the problems in East Orange County is that whatever money's been collected hasn't been spent here. And while we're talking real quickly, I'll just real quick. The county has a 10-year, what they call CIP, Capital Improvement Plan. The road projects that Renzo mentioned are on the plan, but are not funded. They're identified as so-called partnership roads. And I know he said this, but I want to make this clear. Partnership roads are done all the time in Orange County, not in East Orange County. I've done several of them. I did the six laning of Narcusi Road south of the 417 to the Osceola County border, and I did several in Horizon West. I had one guy ask me one night a, month, a couple months ago, why does Horizon West get all the new roads? And the answer is very simple, because they're all partnership roads, and there's actually developers to be partners with the county. This community has done a great job of fending off and scaring off development. The county, the county, Because there's no money coming out of here to be spent on roads. Why? Because the county doesn't have any money. So it is an irony, and it probably for some people not make them happy, but the developers generate economic activity and money, which is then used partially into the roads. So that was the to get into the transportation issue a little bit before next next meeting. It's okay. I've heard you talk a lot about you know developing the area, how it's going to impact the community, et cetera, et cetera. You mentioned several of the jobs from you know Siemens, UCF, all that. But the more I listen to your presentation, the more it seems like these homes that you're planning to put in here are going to be far beyond the affordability of the people that work in this community, that live in this community. That's true, and if we get approved, then there won't be a development, and you, 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 won't, you won't get what you don't want, you won't get what you're worried about. The fact is, is we're going to hit all the price points, because it would really be foolish to go through this kind of effort and the kind of investment we make, only to end up with a product that no one can afford to buy. Price points you mentioned. You've been very vague in a lot of things the whole way through, and I think everybody else here realizes that. But let me know what I'm about because I, I don't know how more specific I could be. But go ahead. 
what kinds of price points are you talking? Are you talking two hundred thousand dollar homes? Are you talking half a million dollar homes? Are you talking million dollar homes? All of the above. So all of the above. All Any of the kind above. Of specifics on a ball the ball is not going to be the kind of budget you, but they have points, price points from lower to higher. I think a well planned community hits all those points because I think it makes for a better community. And how's that going to affect the people that already live here, that as you're developing and how it's been developed, mm -hmm. how many of the existing properties around here are getting flooded out because of improper drainage due to the new Well, I asked the county engineer that very question the day because I saw a lady on television saying that she has a bunch of flooding and she lives on Tanner Road. The county drainage engineer is not aware of flooding on Tanner. So, the engineering, the when, you, when you put a project out there to be designed and ultimately permitted, you hire a civil engineer who's theoretically skilled in designing a community so it doesn't flood other properties. The county's team of engineers then reviews that plan. Further, the state approves the management storage of the stormwater on that project. So you have three layers of review to assure and make sure that there's not flooding coming from the property. Uh, I don't know what more that you could that you could ask for. I think that's a that's a decent system. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Hi. Um, so I think uh, it's really important to note that uh, you know with the amount of applications there's been and the statistics you've shown that the developments are to come. Um, and so I at least appreciate the fact that you've been here since child. You've seen it since it's the dirt roads. Um, but I think it's really important um, to show how you're going to save Orange County because I myself don't want to see another McDonald's community or just another cookie cutter area. Um, and so I guess my question really is with the affordable housing, I mean, you mentioned internships for college students, and it's a big issue, affordable housing. Um, for that demographic. So have you considered maybe anything at all to offer affordable housing? Well, our, our original plans, well, it depends on what you mean by affordable housing. We're not going to have low-income housing. Um, not even close, because that just devalues the community. It devalues, you know, our project. I think, I think that there are quite a few housing developments in the area where the house house prices unfortunately aren't doing that well. I think quarterly estates, I looked on the property appraiser's website the other day, the average appraised value in there by the property appraiser is like 135,000 in that range. I imagine those houses sold for quite a bit more than that. But my wife, who's in the kitchen and bath design business, she goes in and renovates houses. She says, I never have a project out there. Why? Because no one believes in the future of that community. I think we can change that. I really do. This will change that. And we, I do ap appreciate that, absolutely. Um, but I think it's more than that. It's more than just putting in a, another million dollar community because you know there's 3,500 college students that are homeless right now. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people facing renter's burden and would like to be able to take part in this community, whatever it is. But something is I, I love college students. I, I now have two in my, my own house. Um, if they don't have the money to live here, we're not going to try to accommodate them. <laughs> it's that simple. Okay. They will tear up the screen. Okay. Go ahead. You have a lovely picture of my driveway on Lake Mickey Road between Highway 15 and uh, Percival. I measured from state to state across Lake Mickey Road, taking my wife and my own hands. That's 60 feet. You need 90 for four lanes plus. How are you going to do that? Well, I, I haven't put forth any proposal for improving like pick the road. So I, you, you should, I know, and everybody gets us confused. So you, that I would ask the, the next developer because that's really their plan. That's the north. I have the north. Um, I don't, I think the plan is a fine plan, by the way. I don't know about right away. Okay, I just don't know about the right away widths. I just can't answer that question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, most of the people that live out here is because that's what they can afford. Sure. How is this going to uh, do the tax base, base of the folks who are out there? And what are you going to do with your wastewater? What are you going to do with your stormwater, your impervious area? What are your plans for that? Well, we'll design the project like the other 500 projects in, in Orange County. They have to provide roads to the houses. They have to 
collect and treat for water quality, the stormwater. Um, what were your other questions? About a tax base? Yeah, water, we'll get water and sewer. Water and sewer will be provided by Orange County. Uh, we're not going to be on well. We're not going to be on septic. Um, I think the, I don't know what you quite mean by the tax base. Are you concerned that we're well, going to build? Well, with the value of your million dollar homes, what's going to do well, the fact that they have $20,000 homes? The, my folks live in a house near mine that's not as nice as mine, and they pay far less taxes. So I think the property appraiser in Orange County, who I've, I've seen speak, I think he's pretty darn capable. I think he's capable of discerning between a house that's worth 100000 let's say, and one that's worth 600000 So I don't think that's going to affect you. I think that there will be a positive um, effect on values of the community in general, because I really believe this will be an iconic project. This will be very unique, and I think it'll be a true asset to Central Florida, and I think that East Orange uh, will do very well with a project like this. I have one final thing, I'll go. Okay. Baldwin Park has severe flooding issues. I know this for a fact. Okay. So how are you going to differentiate your community setting from Baldwin Park? Well, all I can do is hire the engineers to design it, and the ones that, we, that are on our team have many, many years of experience, have done dozens and dozens and dozens of projects in Orange County. And um, if it's really an issue, and for someone who lives adjacent to us and really is concerned with it, I'd be happy to pay for an engineer of, of their own that they can select, and they can review the plans as well, because the last thing I want to do is design a project that floods somebody. I, I have no interest in doing that. I don't make more money doing that, it doesn't make me happy. So if somebody has a legitimate concern about that, I will hire them an engineer, pay for it, they can pick the engineer, so that that fourth engineer can review the plans and say that they're, that they're good. And I really mean that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Connie Bernhardt. I live on Lake Pickett Road from 50 to the personal split. Um, I have one house on Lake Pickett Road from 50 to the personal split. I have one house on one acre and I like my property. If they, I understand you don't handle the widening the road, but it's going to affect what you want to do too. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if they widen that road, I have no yard. So I'm not interested in that. But the other thing is, I was looking at your proposal and it's beautiful, but we have farmers out here. We have to <laughs> Things. I'm sorry, I just want to finish no, it off. Go, go right out of the way. Go ahead. Um, but your homes are like $200,000. My home is under $100,000. And, and I love my home and I want to stay there. But what you're doing there is building a community that is something like Baldwin Park. It's something like the things they do in California so that you can come and watch your lettuce grow and then put it on your plate. I do that on my own yard. But Great. I don't we want, we, there's a lot of residents that want to do that. But I don't see that in your community. I don't see how you're going to put your horse on a couple of acres and be happy with that. Or you put it in trails, maybe. But I just think that the more you do, it's taking away from the people that are already there. So. I'll make this short and sweet. I was here a year ago. I don't know if anybody recognizes my voice. <laughs> I listened to the same baloney. The roads are going to get fixed. The roads are going to get fixed. We did a survey at noon on, on State Road 50, and there was no traffic whatsoever. He's probably right. But go out there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and go out there at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. And, and all of this... To grow your vegetables, you ain't gonna have time to do that because you ain't gonna make it all the first Stuff. 
on that pretty picture you showed up there with that, that nice little pool out front, I didn't see any stalls, I didn't see any barns, I didn't see any fences out there. Where are the horses going to go? And what are, what's going to happen to the people that did, put horses did in anybody, did, did, I'm sorry, did any, but real quickly, I'll add that one point. Did anybody here that saw the presentation see barn, stables, horses? You got it right across the Maybe I don't know. Maybe I skipped over. Okay, go ahead. You've got it right across from Econ Sand Hills where you're going to have your, your barn right. stall. I'm talking about right. the other places where the I'm not having any other places. places. It's, I, not I, I it's, not it's not an equestrian community. It's not an We have an equestrian oh. component. It's not meant to be elsewhere. I, I never said happen? that people would have half horses on their lot. I never said that. What's going to happen is the people already have horses out there when the homeowner association says, oh, that looks nasty out there. We don't want the horses around us anymore. Well, you go back in and get, get it cleared and run everybody off. Home, our horses. homeowners association will have no right to come to you and say they don't like the way your yard looks. Yeah. Wait till you get some more money. That's what it is right there. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. It's like the other Craig Dunlap. I have a question for you. Olin, I believe Olin was his name mentioned that you offered to advance fund some improvements to State Road 50. Yes, sir. How would those improvements be paid for, and would the residents in Lake Pickett South be assessed, a special assessment to pay for that road? And I have a second part to my question. You mentioned just a minute ago in response to one of your uh, comments that Orange County would provide water and wastewater service to this area. Uh, most everybody here has a well and a septic tank. Would existing residents be required to hook up to county water and wastewater service? And if so, I assume they'd have to pay the county impact fees, which could be a substantial amount of money. Yeah, a uh, couple of things. Uh, no special assessment. That's coming out of my pocket. Um, the uh, question about the utilities, the, um, the, the county utility department is here, but I know the answer is no. They do not require if a pipe is run by your house and you're currently on septic or well that you connect. But I, I would be happy to let, let them answer if they have yeah, more to add to that. I'm correct. Okay. So it's available for anybody who wants to get off of well or septic, but it's not a requirement that you hook into it. Okay. I hey, gotta go. I'm, getting, one other quick question. I'm getting a signal. You, I need to you mentioned uh, that you pay for the roads. I'm sure you would have, you, you're not going to pay for them out of your pocket. You're going to pay for them in the profits you make on building homes and other things. I'm going to pay for it out of my pocket and out of revenues associated with the project and otherwise out of my pocket. Would it bother you that I pay for it out no, of profit? No, no, but okay. somebody's got to pay for it. Okay, yeah, that's got to be me. Okay, yes, ma'am. Hi, this is sort of off topic, but it will completely tie into this. This side of Orange County has a major student overpopulation in their schools. East of the Econ? Yes. Okay, I thought, you, I thought you were talking about college students. I'm sorry. So, Go ahead. Actual middle school, there's a very heated middle school battle going on over at Avalon that could impact even this school as far as we zoning. How are you going to ensure that your new development, all the children that would bring in, are not going to then rezone other children like myself to other middle schools that maybe we didn't move into certain houses to avoid? I, I can't assure you that the school district over time won't rezone or redistrict property. You can't get that assurance anywhere. No, but, but yeah. are you leaving land? Are you we're leaving providing, property to build a school that meets the needs of the entire We're providing. Are you working with the community, the county on the school level and any other that may need to be to make sure that you're not adding so many people that on top of already needing five schools, now we need six or seven in this area, as well as taking up area that could have potentially been used for schools. In, in our project, we're providing a roughly 15 acres. That's the size requirement for an elementary. Uh, it's, it was actually on our site plan. You can see it on the board up there if you want to look at it after the meeting. Uh, elementary school site. If we do a charter school, which is what I want to do, we'll likely do a K-8. <laughs> 
and the student generation rates that the school district uses to project the number of kids that will come from the community uh, are such that our school, a K-8, would accommodate those kids, more or less. And the high school, yeah. Um, all of that. A charter school has to be open to the entire town, not just this. No, there are there are distance preferences, and if the developer pays for the school or contributes the cash to the school, maybe doesn't pay for the whole thing, that community can get a preference. I know a lot about this, and no, it's not open to the whole community. And as a practical matter, what parent wants to send their second grader from Windermere to school in, in East Orange? It just doesn't happen. Um, look. Eight minutes. Go ahead, Ann. I have just two quick questions. Um, I really wanted to say that I appreciate the naturalistic aspect that you're adding to the community. And I just had, I just had a question. I know in our area we have a lot of sandhill cranes, which are an endangered species. And I was wondering about your idea of the effect on those species. Well, before we can develop, we have to do, and I've got this be better with some notes in front of you, but we have to do a sandhill crane study. And if there um, is a nest uh, on the property, you have to stay a certain distance away from the nest. But during mating season, which is I think January to June, you're not allowed to be anywhere near them. Um, now I think that after mating season, you can go into those areas, but um, they are the uh, environmental studies, we got two of them because we have a couple of different property owners. Uh, there was uh, no nesting for sandhill cranes, but a pair was spotted on the north edge of the property. But unless there's a nest, you don't really trigger any kind of jurisdictional uh, restrictions or requirements. And I can, I've got my biologist here, he can speak more to that, but um, I love sandhill cranes. Okay. And also, what percentage of the land will you use for environmental purposes specifically? We have um, roughly, like I said, a little over 1,200 acres, roughly a little over 300 wetland and lakes, and then the 35% the, uh, uh, open space uh, requirement is another. We have, I think, a little over half of the overall acreage is either uh, is preserved. 55% of our total acreage is preserved. Is open space or wetlands and, and lakes. All right, thank you. Yep. Incidentally, just so you know, uh, in case you haven't done the math, the density of our project on a gross basis is about 1.8, and the density on our project on a net basis is about 2.5. That's pretty low density. Uh, go ahead, sir. Well, I have a comment and a recommendation. Yes, sir. So my comment is that you made a great presentation, but it seems like it's a presentation to prospective people. Almost everybody here already lives here. And my sadness was you didn't make a presentation hardly at all. That would be for us. What we, I think I want to know why this is a good idea for those of us who already live here. Your arguments are all about the company and about prospective people. So my recommendation is, the next time you brief us, tell us why we should like this. You didn't say anything in 15 minutes that would make me want to like it. And I was open minded I think my aunt and I probably, if it wasn't off the top of my head, I'd give you a better answer or a more complete answer. Maybe the next time we talk, I'll, I'll give you more. But, what I try to do is when I look at a property and I see a surrounding area, surrounding feel and vibe and community, I try to fit in, number one. So I think the agri-head idea with high quality um, specific design standards will create a very um, high quality community, which I believe will have a ripple effect into some of the surrounding areas. I believe that's a benefit. Certainly you're not getting that from Quarter Lake Estates. I mean, I have nothing I know that I've talked to people in there, and I've had them even say, gosh, our community could use a kick in the rear end. All right? That's number one. Number two, we have trails crisscrossing our project that connect to the adjacent areas. So if you like to ride your bike or you like to walk, you can come in and enjoy what we're creating here. Three, I'm talking about educating kids with a unique curriculum in our K-8 school. I'm providing how many... 
people do you just hang out with that have provided elementary school sites to the community? How many people do you know who are going to spend $20 million on your roads for, for problems I didn't cause? Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, what, convince me that where you live is great and I should be there. I mean, I, what, what do you want me to tell you? Uh, that's, how, that's part of my answer. If you have uh, examples from other communities that have the same complaints that we have, and those all mostly went away because you came in miraculously changed their lives, that's part of your, if I was your boss, I would say that's the presentation you need to make. You need to make us think that this is a good thing. And you didn't make it strong enough. Okay. Okay. I, I, I appreciate that. I, stronger. I appreciate that. I, I will mention uh, also that, you know, putting 30 acres of land that is high value land into gardens and farms isn't cheap. Believe me, I'm paying for that land and all the costs that go into pre uh, preparing the land for use. Three minutes, so it's going to have to be really quick, ma'am. My name is Arte Gracia Primas, and I just want to share with you that I am very skeptical about the real success of your farm food table projection. It sounds good in theory, but what I have seen in similar projects in Winter Garden is fake, totally fake. They are growing herbs in little wooden boxes where children play. They have paid a farmer to plant strawberries for them. I really do not see anybody that owns a quarter million home really growing what they are going to eat. That's all I want to say. Well, I, I appreciate that. I garden and my house is worth more than a quarter million and I, I garden and we love it. And so my whole family enjoys it. So go ahead. What's your name? All right. Hi. Well, Brooke, I'm one of the residents who live not too far from here. You talk about agri-operations. None of your pictures you showed were animal proof, were bug proof. Are you going to kill all the animals? Are you going to kill all the bugs? Well, we well, don't have to answer. Please don't. I only have three minutes. Okay. Well, someone for your information, here. the sandhill crane, since you can't get in their area when they're mating, they mate for life. I like that as a solution. <laughs> you must go home. The next thing do you have a question? project do you, have a question? you show in the upper left hand side. I'm sorry, do you have a question for me? Because I can talk to you after the meeting. Uh, listen to me. Okay. Is there a question? Your project showed in the upper left hand corner one that you've already produced. Four rows of plants and all of the rest of the many acres for uncontrolled weeds. Is that what we're gonna get? I have no idea what you're talking about. So go Just ahead. look at your own picture. Here, for Owen and for Renzo, going at the same time that we're through the approval process, someone should also remember and be reminded that this is a disapproval process. Please don't do something like you did with Lee Vista, really. There is a reason that the Long Range Planning Committee exists, and that is so that we have Long Range Planning. And in your long-range planning, you have a little red line. And it is to the left of the econ. It is not past the Rubicon. In order to get past the Rubicon, you have to have, you have some roads that you've shown, the Renzo showed, but they lead to nowhere. They lead to nowhere because, oh, you have to put a bridge across and construction across the little econ. The big econ, the main road. Do we really want that? You don't have the infrastructure no, no. for this. You do not have the infrastructure for this. You do not have the money to support this. You must disapprove it. It must not be an approval process. It must be a disapproval process. of the night for most of us, but my name is Dave Otterson, this is my wife Lisa, she's here to nudge me if I get excitable. Uh, we own a property uh, on uh, Lake Pickett, I actually own three properties on the corner of Lake Pickett and South Tanner Road. I have a video camera, record the accidents on a weekly basis on that corner if you want any information. My children cannot play in the park because of the homosexual activity in the new park that's located next to me. 
talk to the police department. I also own an equestrian facility there for over 10 years. Most people know Pain and Oaks Academy. My curiosity is, how is the following road in front of my leaf boy chair going to improve my quality of life? And how is the equestrian facility across the street in the community that you itself have called just an aspect, not an equestrian development, as you have horses crossing a four-lane road on a daily basis into the park, and call yourself the growth community as you plant little planters under the power lines, from one end of the power lines to the other, and make everybody believe that have the media think we're growing an agricultural community. development with half a million dollar homes with no home for anybody in our community. And my question, which is my final question, how is this going to benefit me, my two young sons, and my ranch that I've been building up for 10 years to have an equestrian facility built across the street from my equestrian facility? Well, we're going to have about 2,000 houses, which should be about 4,000 people I'm sure we can find out of those 4,000, 10 people that want to put a horse in a stable. It's, it it's, it's, shouldn't affect your business at all. My stable's full. Good, then you're full, then the ones who can't get in there, because evidently there's a demand for it, and the people who like to ride horses in this community I've spoken to say there's a demand for a boarding place. So we're looking at maybe putting 10 horses in a stable, primarily to service the community, and you're full, so that is the horse trails in the community. Is there horse trails going through the community? No, there are not horse trails going through the community. Oh, so you got ten horses that cross the street every day. The horses will cross the street to get to the trailhead. Yes. And then where do they go to eat? Okay. They feed in the stalls, or do they have a paddock? Or have a paddock? Okay, because the people that you have representing your growth community only grow organic food in places other than Florida. They have nothing to do with the equestrian facilities. None of these people that are representing your growth community have ever done anything equestrian ever. If that's true, and we really that is are, true, and we're really bad at it, then our little three acres uh, uh, stable and paddock won't succeed, and it won't be across the street from your house. So it's just a trick then. It's going to succeed. Yeah. Respectful to the speakers. We really appreciate that. I think it's been a productive meeting so far.